Today, I'm going to give you this speed talk on one weird thing that the faculty at Stony Brook University are into. And uh, the weird thing I'm passionate about is soil. Yeah, so I agree, soil's weird. So, um, okay, now I got this. So let's talk about soil for a minute. The first thing I wanna do is convince you that soil is important. So it provides all of our food because virtually everything we eat either grows in soil or the things that we eat, eat the things that grow in soil. It provides fuel like um, wood for burning, provides fiber, and if that means wool from the sheep that eat the things that grow in soil or cotton, which grows in soil. We can talk about erosion control. Um, one of the import, another important thing, things that soil does is filters water. So um, that means that the layer between, the soil layer between your feet and any particular underwater gla underground glacier is protected by the soil. We can talk about the other things, but really I want you to focus on food, fuel, fiber, and water. Those are the things that we care the most about. And it's particularly important that we protect our soil and think about soil and understand soil when we think about the fact that we have over 7 billion people to feed, to water, to clothe, and to house. So when I was talking back here about all the things that we use soil for, we call those ecosystem services. So soil provides food, that's an ecosystem service. It cleans our water, that's an ecosystem service. And the only way that soil can produce these services, support these services, is by a whole suite of creatures that live both underneath the surface and on top of the surface. This photo right here, I was trying to get one of those inspirational, let me hold the soil in my hand, oh, picture. And my chicken's like, oh my gosh, there's gonna be grubs in there. And so she was clearly interested in the below ground ecosystem services that the soil could produce. So one of my favorite creatures that lives in the soil and actually on top of the soil is the earthworm. Earthworms are awesome. So it turns out that in um, terrestri temperate terrestrial ecosystems like here, earthworms are the most abundant biomass in the soil. So think about that. When you pick up a bunch of soil, the thing that's the, the most biomass is the earthworm. That's a lot of worms. So earthworms themselves deliver a whole bunch of ecosystem services. And I'm not gonna go through all of these, but let's just touch on some of the more interesting ones. The first thing they do is they chew things up and poop them out, and that process creates soil. They also make these awesome tunnels, and that develops a soil structure. And when they make these, these tunnels, not only are they providing infrastructure in the soil, but they're coating those tunnels with a slime coat from their mucus. By making those tunnels, they're also regulating water. They're, they're controlling the flow of water from the top to the bottom. When there's a flood and you don't want your, your soil to wash away and it doesn't, it's because worms have built these, these tunnels through. A lot of people, when they find worms on the sidewalk, they're like, oh, the poor things, they were drowning, they ran for it. No, that's not what happened. What happened is there was so much rain, they got washed out of their slimy tunnels and they ended up on the sidewalk. So I don't wanna get into nutrient cycling because that's chemistry. Primary production means um, plant growing. Climate <laughs> regulation, that's pretty cool. Do you know that having worms in your soil sequesters carbon and reduces, the, um, and reduces greenhouse gas emissions? Here's the thing that I focus the most about, and that's pollution remediation and the effect of pollution on earthworms. <laughs> this one cracks me up. Somebody put on the list of earthworm ecosystem services, cultural services. And maybe you're wondering what that is. So they mean fishing, but the nerds who wrote the paper I read about this said, oh yes, for dissecting in biology class. I think the worms rolled their eyes at that. Okay, so these three pictures should convince you how cool the worms are. Look at this, see this white tunnel right here? Do you know what that is? Some nerd poured plastic down a, a, a night crawler's hole so this is a tunnel right here made by a nightcrawler. 
That is amazing, an amazing deep hole. This picture right here in the middle, this is the top 10 centimeters of soil. We call that the drillosphere. And we, this is showing two different types of earthworms, the tunnels they make. So as you're walking over, your, over the grass, wherever you're walking on grass, and you're like, oh, there's just dirt underneath my feet. It is really engineered. It is filled with all of these complicated tunnels. And this photo, this photo right here is like Dune. You've shrunk yourself, you sunk your spikes into a worm, and you're about to go down the tunnel. This is actually a tunnel that a worm made. This is the worm's eye view, but worms don't have eyes. Okay, worms cannot do this amazing stuff alone though. They do not act alone. So the first thing that my research focuses on are these guys right here, which are the soil microbes. So worms rely on soil microbes and soil microbes rely on worms. And you're like, oh, that's complicated. It is complicated because if you kill enough of these guys, you end up hurting the worms. And if you hurt the worms, you end up killing these guys. So whenever you're trying to support soil ecosystem services, you have to make sure that you're supporting both the worms and the soil microbes. So worms and microbes together provide these four ecosystem services. They decompose stuff, okay, boring. I mean, important, but boring. They maintain soil microbial diversity. So when you are trying to maximize soil function, most of the time you're trying to find a medium or medium high biodiversity um, measure. And Worms and microbes together can do that. So this has to do with carbon se sequestration, especially after you've gone and you've dug a hole or paved over something and then unpaved it or paved it over and 20 years later, it unpaves itself. Um, worms can make sure that your soil stays in place. And if you are into agriculture, which weirdly I find that I am, um, the thing that worms and, and, and microbes can do together, they control the fungus and, uh, and nematodes that want to kill our crop plants, which I think is amazing. You don't need chemicals. You just need to make sure you have the right microbes and the worms working together in the soil. Okay, so this is a photo from my yard. You can see that this soil right here, like you can see the grains of sand because we live on Long Island and it's very sandy. And you can see the it's a little sunny where I'm sitting, but you can see, maybe you can see, there, if you look carefully, there is in fact a wormhole someplace in here, but you can easily see here that this soil has been worked, which what I mean is that the worm ate it and then pooped it out and it gives it a very distinct look. Um, the soil that's been worked by worms has a high microbial count and worms don't like to eat their own poop, not surprising because who would, but um, and so what happens is worms will chew through a bunch of soil and then move and then chew through a bunch of soil and move. And so all of their tunnels will be interconnected. Okay, so hopefully I've convinced you that the soil, the worms and the microbes who live beneath the soil are pretty important. Now let's talk for a minute about the creatures that live on top. And even though we could talk about the chickens and the chickens like to talk about themselves, we're not gonna talk about the chickens. We're gonna talk about soil dwelling insects. Okay. So soil dwelling insects. So most of the time in the literature, when you're talking about soil dwelling insects, you're talking about something called springtails. You could also talk about these pill bugs, which are pretty common. And when you take bio 204, you're gonna go catch some. Um, but in fact, in my lab, I use cockroaches because they're super big. And also it's really funny to tell people that you study cockroaches. So we've got all of these insects, uh, in the um, services that insects provide. Uh, it, there, there's not going to be any surprises here. They're really similar to what you saw from the worms and from the soil themselves. We've got climate mitig mitigation, soil fertility because bug poop turns out to be a major component of soil. Um, food production, all the rest um, is familiar to you. We don't need to look at all of these. Okay, this picture right here is a cockroach and cockroaches um, these particular cockroaches are soil dwelling, as are most North American cockroaches. This one's not North American. Do you know what this cockroach is doing? This soil dwelling cockroach, it is pollinating this plant. And this plant is only pollinated by cockroaches. So if you were a cockroach hater, hate them no longer. Okay, 
So this, this hole right here is also from my yard and it was dug by a bug. I did not instruct, sorry. I didn't see who, who dug it, but I have a lot of um, those big black beetles that are called root borers. I suspect it was a root borer. Okay, so now I hope I've convinced you that the creatures that live under the soil, the ones and the microbes are super important. And the creatures that live on top of it, the soil dwelling insects are also super important because they provide all of these ecosystem services and they allow soil to provide those ecosystem services. Hopefully I've convinced you that soil is important because if you like to eat, drink, wear clothes, have a house or burn fuel, you need soil. Okay, so let's talk about soil in the Anthropocene. So soil's got this problem in that it's under our feet everywhere we go. And that means that everything we make, everything we eat, everything we use ends up where? In the dirt. This includes heavy metals outside of industry, outside of mines. It includes fertilizers, chemicals, and pesticides in agricultural settings. It includes microplastics virtually everywhere humans go and some places we don't go. So everything we make ends up in the soil and you gotta worry given the importance of soil, the importance of worms, the important importance of soil microbes and insects, what is happening here? So my lab is called the worm lab, which is funny because it's also the cockroach lab and I think we're about to do planarians for some reason, I can't really tell you. But um, my personal passion has to do not just with soil health, but two particular contaminants. My um, pet can contaminant is uh, the active ingredient in Roundup. Roundup is a weed killer. Its active ingredient is glyphosate. Um, the reason I hate glyphosate, uh, or hate is a strong word and not exactly right, because there are worse pesticides um, than this, but the reason that I'm particularly concerned about glyphosate is that it's virtually in all of our food. And I'm not going to go into the slide, but this slide is true. All those things in that meal contain trace amounts of glyphosate, which you probably didn't sign up to eat, but you probably are eating anyway. Okay, but I want to talk about the warm lab. Um, so I spent a lot of time uh, studying, measuring what happens to earthworms and soil microbes. I'm going to talk about the microbes so much. Um, when you add glyphosate to soil, and I don't want to talk too much about this graph, except for to say this this bar shows what happens when you have Roundup. This one has Roundup. This has no Roundup. This has no Roundup. This is stress test survival time. So when you add Roundup, worms die fast. That's one take home message from this slide. Maybe a more interesting uh, take home message to all of my um, incoming freshmen is this list over here. This graph is published in a journal called Applied Soil Ecology. And these are all of the authors who, who co-authored this paper with me. Everybody on this list, except for me, is a student. This kid right here is a graduate student. All of the rest of these students are undergraduate students. These students end up doing amazing things. Kids in med school, this kid's in architecture school, med school, vet school, she's going to grad school. Okay, this is the same list of students and again, this is showing that Roundup does bad things to worms. Worms don't like it. This is another graph that shows that glyphosate rather than Roundup does bad things to worms. This is another publication. This one came out this year. And again, this is the list of authors. I'm the only faculty on here. Everybody else on my list is a student. So if you're looking, okay, let's talk. She's had, she hasn't graduated, hasn't graduated, hasn't graduated. This guy has just got into an MBA program, and this guy just got into dental school. Okay, this is another one. So like I said, I, the Worm Lab studies cockroaches. So we have a cockroach paper um, in review right now. And this, this cockroach research involved three labs on Stony Brook campus. Um, we had um, Somas's Dr. Niels Volkenborn um, gave it and his graduate student eat Ian Dwyer helped us with this one. And we had um, Dr. Marvin O'Neill over in biology helped us with this one. This is uh, work that came out of Megan Canabar's um, honors project. And this one is in review in, I can't remember what journal, but some journal. Okay, 
So anyway, all of these students are going to get published. This kid right here, this one's a high school student. Oh, actually, so is Janelle. Okay, so what does this graph show? This graph shows that living with Roundup does bad things to cockroaches. Does more bad things to cockroaches. Does more really bad things to cockroaches. This is really funny uh, in an ironic and dark way. When you make roaches eat Roundup, in their food, it makes them so uncoordinated they can't run on a hamster wheel. They actually get to the top and fall off. Okay, so Roundup and glyphosate, that's um, one focus of my interest, but microplastics is another place where I focus a lot of my attention. And the reason that I focus on microplastics is because a couple years ago I had a student come to me and he said, hey, Pochran, uh, this kid was a goalie. He's like, have you heard about that cancer cluster in Oregon? Am I gonna get cancer from playing soccer? Like, dude, I don't know, but we can figure out what it does to worms. So we did. And um, again, this is, we got two papers out of this particular topic. It turns out that nobody's going to be surprised that worms don't particularly like living with microplastics. And um, let's see, this kid is running an education program out west. This kid is about to become, um, she's interning in museums and she's in a, She's in Canada. She's a top reporter. You'll hear this one on NPR. He just got into engineering school. He's getting um, his master's in engineering. She's going to graduate school. This kid is about to be a sea wolf. Okay, and this is, these are follow-up graphs that just show you that um, living with microplastics is bad for worms. Okay, so at this point, I hope I've convinced you that when you add contamination to soil, you hurt the things that live beneath the soil, you hurt the things that live on top of the soil, you are probably reducing the ability of soil to provide our food, our fuel, our water, our clothing. And by doing so, um, we're jeopardizing our ability to take care of seven, more than seven billion people. Okay, but I don't want you to despair. No despair allowed. Why not? So when I was a kid and you'd turn on the news, there was often the pictures of rivers on fire. I grew up in Chicago. I remember the Chicago River being on fire. This is the Cuyahoga River in Cleveland. Those are flames coming out of what? The water. This is the Cuyahoga River now. Super clean. You can fish out of it. It's very nice. When was the last time you guys saw a river on fire? Bet it. Bet never if you guys are actually young sea wolves or sea wolves to be. And not only is our water clean, but our air is clean. So this is LA in 1968. This is LA in 2005. This is a map in the, of the United States in the 1989 and 91. All of this is unbreathable, nasty. And look at it now, super clean. It's even cleaner right now because when we shut down the economy, it got really, really clean. And the reason that we got this clean water and this clean air was because of the Clean Water Act and the Clean Air Act. So I would like to leave you with this idea that we should consider implementing a Clean Soil Act. This, this photo right here shows, it looks, you guys are like, oh, that's just a field. This is actually a field where they've dumped a whole bunch of petroleum and they've spread it out to dilute it. They didn't know what else to do with the petroleum. Nobody is ever going to be able to use the soil because petroleum isn't something that microbes can easily break down. If we control the, some of the easier contaminants of soil, our pesticides and our herbicides, then we will be protecting our future. Um, and I want to leave you with one crazy idea. And I think that um, my crazy idea is this. Instead of using Roundup and other weed killers, why don't we instead use Roombas? Every time it's, it rains, we can send out a fleet of robots. They can drill out all the mares tails and water hemp. They can go back to the recharger. No Roundup or Decamba necessary. All right, that's what I got for you guys. Okay, so just to recap, if you guys are undergraduate students who are looking to get involved in, in research, come see me. Uh, I take undergraduates in the worm lab. Normally, I run research projects over the summer. 
um, sometimes with high school students, not always with high school students. Um, I'm running a research project this summer that is um, got one high school student, one graduate student, and three undergraduate students. Um, we're doing all bioinformatics and literature reviews, which isn't quite as fun as poisoning worms and watching them die, but nonetheless. Oh, Riley. Hi, Riley. Riley worked in the worm lab when she was in high school. Where would I find the worm lab? Well, physically, the worm lab is in the basement of the life sciences building, which is in the, um, which is the green, which is where the greenhouse is. Greenhouse is in the basement. Go figure. Um, but if what if you if you want to actually find your way there when I'm there, I would email me. Not I'm not hard to find. So actually, if you Google Poffer and Worm Lab, probably even Worm Lab Stony Brook University, you'd be able to find me. Sharon, we had a question. Um, in uh, someone's past research experiment, they used plants as a means to reduce metal concentrations in the soil. Um, have you thought of using plants as a means to clean the soil? Um, I am more interested, yes. Uh, bi Biome remediation is something that got me interested in this to begin with. And in fact, worms are great bioremediators. They'll vacuum up a lot of heavy metals. In fact, uh, for the real nerds in the group, um, a couple of my colleagues and I are using worms to um, um, eat cadmium and selenium to make quantum dots. Um, I don't use plants to clean up the soil myself because I'm personally more interested in, in the impact of really common soil contaminants on non-torgan organisms such as the plants, the microbes, the bugs, and the worms. So, um, yeah. Uh, true fact that you can clean up the clean up a lot of contamination with plants, particularly rice. Okay. So somebody says, what are some of the highlights of the ecosystems and human impact major? Okay, so um, I love, I think I have, the, I think I get to be the director of the best major out there, although I see some other directors in the crowd here, they may disagree with me, but I got the speaker, haha. -ha. Um, let's see, so ecosystem services impact, uh, I'm sorry, the ecosystems and human impact major is good for a couple of things. First of all, for people who want to go and work in industry for all of the, um, you know, the laboratory, the environmental um, assessment companies, you can go right from this major, you know, to the, to the water companies, to the um, water quality companies, the soil companies, the soil quality companies, and a lot of my students do that. The other thing that my students end up doing when they graduate is it's a pathway to graduate school. 